Education Strategy Update. Game Division Administrator Brian Wakeman, informational the department had analyzed financial data regarding license structure and proposed and proposed the revenue neutral pricing structure that has been shared with the public at five community open houses. The department will try to provide an overview of the information obtained to date. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the commission. Um, you know, if I could, this informal thing is working. We have a formal agreement. Just <laughs> I would encourage everybody to continue asking questions informally as we go through this. Um, I know a lot of, of folks have probably seen parts of this, um, but um, there have been some important changes. We've kind of come to some of the uh, price points that we think we could, uh, would be a, a good place to move forward with our license simplification um, as we go forward. And, uh, you know, a lot of this that's been discussed here is, is really, um, you know, interrelated. You know, uh, you had asked the question about trying to engage the public and trying to keep them and how you get that input. Um, we used several different public outreach um, efforts as we went through this license simplification process so far. We're still using others. Um, and it, it's something you just, you just have to keep trying and, and keep working on. Um, oftentimes at public meetings, um, you know, they're, they're very similar at times to focus groups. Focus groups, we invite people in. Um, public meetings, oftentimes we're trying to invite people in. We don't have quite the, the same kind of closed door approach. Um, but oftentimes those are really good opportunities to, to identify the, the breadth of the, of the issues and concerns that people have. Um, when you're trying to figure out how many fe people feel a particular way, public meetings are not the best avenue in order to get that. And so you have to explore a lot of different approaches. Um, license simplification is something that we came to um, a little over a year, year ago, I think, was one of the first discussions. I don't know who the director was, we may have been talking about it long prior to that. But you know, the first the first question we start thinking about is why? Why in the world would we try to simplify what it is we do? Um, anytime we've done any of our online questionnaires, when we talk to people in the field, um, by and large, people tell us the Nevada Department of Wildlife does a good job. The Wildlife Administrative Services does a good job. Why, do we, why would we be trying to do better? And essentially, the, the upshot of that is, is you don't have to be sick to get better. Um, it's, it's, uh, in our leadership teams, it's something that uh, Director Wazza has been trying to instill in everyone, is what we really want to do is focus on how we can continue to deliver value to the, uh, to the public and to our customers. And so that really it. We're trying to uh, focus on delivering value, trying to make this confusion uh, you know, when we talk to people, our, our law enforcement officers often speak with uh, folks in the, uh, you know, checking a uh, fisherman perhaps someplace or uh, someone at a front counter is trying to sell someone who's going fishing a trout stamp and they're going, well, I don't want to catch trout. Well, sometimes you're in a, in a trout stream and if you don't have a trout stamp and you catch a trout, you become an inadvertent error, you know, an inadvertent violator and that can cost you. It can drive away our customers. And so what we want to do is reduce the chance for inadvertent error. We want to make it easier, and we want people to find it easier to engage in these activities. The first thing that everybody comes to shortly after that is, well, you must be trying to make more money. Well, even if we were trying to make more money, our BMWs are already the fastest on the, on the street. Um, again, a bad choice for the bad attempt at humor. But uh, essentially, um, what we've gone through throughout this whole effort is to remain revenue neutral. And we didn't even try to establish what our price points were going to be until after the last commission meeting. After we got through um, our public, uh, several public input phases, we had, uh, and I'll go through those real briefly, um, but <clears throat> based on what we've seen um, and what we came to here with our, with our estimates, it's, it's really difficult to model because if you change uh, prices, if you change the, the, the things that are available to you, um, it's likely going to change people's behavior. They're going to make a different selection. But if everybody continues to buy the licenses that we've had in the past, 
and just converts to the new ones, uh, we expect that this will affect probably less than two tenths of one percent. And it may be less than that. But looking at some of the neighborhood $15,000 with about a $7 million uh, revenue generation from the overall effort. So it, it's about as revenue neutral as we can get it. This um, current structure largely identifies why it's so complex or why we want to start looking at a more simpler way of doing it. It's, it's complicated now. Um, we've had people in the focus groups that we've held that have said, you know, they, they may be able to uh, navigate the application system and get everything else done, but they're afraid to go fishing because they don't want to make a mistake. And being someone who's gone to another state and hunted, um, I don't know how many of you have done that, but you're always feeling like, well, this is not something I'm really familiar with and how they do it here, and it's possible that I might do something wrong. Uh, we've compared, we did, we employed a, uh, um, an outside vendor, uh, a uh, Chase and Chase, um, and uh, they are, this is what they do. Uh, they help, uh, they, they're human dimension specialists and they work in the wildlife uh, conservation community. Um, we got them, the first thing they did was a comparative analysis for us. They looked at um, how the other states around us um, are operating, what they're going to be, how, how they have simplified, some have, some haven't. Um, but the one thing that becomes really apparent, if you look at the, uh, um, the slide here, and then what you see is the dates that uh, all the various states have actually, um, the last time they updated theirs, I'm not sure, Nevada's is 2004, the closest to us is Idaho in 2009. Everybody else has updated their structure within the last three years. And so they, everybody's done it more recently than we have. So then we moved into the qualitative focus uh, groups, the qualitative analysis phase. This is the first time we went to the public and we asked them, and we did this in six different cities. The Nevada Department of Wildlife was not in the room while the questions were being asked, while the focus groups were going on. We were there, we introduced people uh, to the to Lauren Chase, got things started, and we have like eight to 10 people in each of six cities identified, and again, like I said earlier, this is where we identify the issues, the breadth of concern that people may have uh, regarding. Uh, now I want to specify the people we invited to this were hunters and anglers, they weren't the general public. And this is important because um, the people who are going to be most influenced by any changes to this are going to be the hunters and anglers. Um, it doesn't alter, you know, the number of animals that are going to get harvested because we're still going to regulate that. Um, but it, but it did. It was specific to hunters and anglers. And so what we we talked to them about is the tools that they were using. What are their issues? What are their opinions? What concerns they might have? We then moved into a quantitative phase. In the quantitative phase, um, we uh, had a questionnaire that was based on the issues that were raised in the focus groups. Uh, the questionnaire, um, it was a phone survey. It was conducted to just under 1,700 licensed anglers and hunters. Um, statistically valid, and at this point, it, it plus or minus 3%. This is uh, similar to what they use for uh, presidential polling and things of that nature. Um, and it's statistically valid, and this approach tells you what proportion of the people feel a particular way. Based on the feedback that we received from that, and those were two different separate efforts to go out to the public, um, following that, this presentation that I'm sharing with you right now, um, we took this out to the to the public as well and share them with the final ideas. And this is something that we developed after the last commission meeting. <coughs> and so the, uh, the details, um, the commission hadn't even seen it. In fact, this is the first time that, that we're sharing those numbers uh, formally with them. They asked us to, what we heard was they wanted things to be simplified. And so I'm gonna go through this one with just a little bit of detail, and then I'm gonna go through several other license structures uh, a little bit more rapidly. Um, but what they told us is they want to see a license that's valid 365 days from the date of purchase. 
a lot of people um, have the sense that if I buy a license in the fall, it's only good for four months. I don't, it's a full price. I don't feel like I'm getting my, my full value out of it. Um, we kind of independently stopped in at a couple of uh, sporting goods stores and asked a couple of people that sell these things, and they said, man, that's absolutely the, the truth. That's exactly what they get. Um, they also hate to be nickel to dime for every additional stamp. And so what they wanted is a license that includes all the stamps. And so you'll have all of that rolled into one. Um, that way, it takes away confusion. Do I have all the stamps I need? It also takes away any chance for, you know, <clears throat> dickering at the counter. You know, yes, you do need a trout stamp, or no, I don't. So we looked at the hunting license, <clears throat> and if you look at what a current price is, currently if you're buying a resident hunting license, it's $33. If you're an upland game hunter, you're going to spend $10 for the stamp. Right there, you're at $43. If you also are a duck, duck hunter, you've got another $10, you're up to 53 bucks. Um, the average hunter, when who just bought a resident hunting license in 2016, spent $37.83. And so if we round that up to $40, that means the average hunter is going to spend $2.17 more than what he does now, but he doesn't have to worry about whether or not he's got all the stamps he's and it winds up, uh, most of the people I know are spending $43 anyways because they're either going to buy an upland stamp or a duck stamp or something of that nature. So well, we need to make this informal, right, Brian? Well, yes, absolutely. So right now the $10 for the, for the upland game stamp, the $10 for the state duck stamp, go to those programs to fund projects. Yes. So how would that be accounted for? Well, and if you look at these prices right now, um, what you could say is the on an average um, stamp or an average license, you're spending to the average hundred now spending thirty-seven dollars and eighty-three cents. So what we would propose is that we can calculate a percentage of the of your fees of your average hunter from seven years. How much of that goes to the duck stamp? How much of that goes to the up and game fund? And so we would not do away with those funds. Those funds would be in place, they would be retained. And what we would do is, is look at that proportion, and what we would do is allocate that proportion for every license, every resident money license that's sold, and it would still go in that. The real benefit to this is if we do that, and we adopt that, we wind up with a much more uh, stable funding stream. Because if you look at the highs and lows between years when we've got water and when we don't have water, you may have, you do see fluctuations in the number of people who buy duck stamps. We see some fluctuations in the number of people who buy other game stamps. And so what we would wind up generating is a more stable fund source and we would know what was coming into it. Okay? So our proposal with, with none of these is to do away with any of the funds. We would still manage those behind the scenes and should be funded identical to what it is Great question. Um, what do you do about the senior and the veterans and stuff like that? Uh, pardon me? What is a senior board a combo license, hunting, fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, these, what, what do you do for those people? Does everybody pay the same price now? Well, let, me, uh, let me go through okay. these. I've got uh, several of them, but essentially, yes. Um, so what we've got here for a non-resident is in Arizona has done something like this. You have a non-resident hunting license. Um, you know, what we're proposing is we do away with the resident, uh, non-resident hunting and get a combination license. This has got some benefits to us because part of our Pittman Robertson formula, the federal, the federal uh, um, grants that we receive and the, and the deal with Johnson on the fisheries in. It's based on the number of certified license purchases that we have. And so if we can certify more hunters, we can get a larger slice of that pie we're eligible for. We still have to come up with a match. We still have to uh, follow all the other procedures. But this is something a lot of other states have already done, and so we're losing our slice of that pie. So I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get to the combination licenses. Angling. 
again, looking at a suggested price of $40. That $40 price would include the trout stamp, second rod stamp, special use Colorado River stamp. So you get the whole enchilada. In 2016, the average angler spent $39.64. So we're talking about a 36 cent difference from what they've been spending. Um, we've got a one day fishing license, it's already in existence. Um, you know, some people just want to be able to go for a short period of time, and we're not recommending any changes to this program. Keep it as it is. Yes. So, Brian, um, so how wide is the range? I mean, we've got an average there. Um, are we talking some we're spending, you know, 45 or $50, and some we're spending, you know, 30 or are we talking yes. some we're spending, you know, $80, and others we're spending $1 or $2? Um, the, the range um, is pretty much, I mean, your bottom line, if you're going to get into the fishing license, you're going to spend $29. And so there are people who are spending um, the trout stamp and the second rod stamp are both, uh, it, and when you get to the Colorado River stamp, um, I think cumulatively you're looking at $23. So some people are spending $29, some people are spending $52. You propose he spends 40. I'm sorry? You propose that they spend 40. Yes. We're proposing they spend 40. And he gets the extra, he gets the trout stamp, he gets a second rod stamp, and a special Colorado River stamp. Even yep. if he doesn't use it. Yep. Everybody gets it. Looking at non residents, um, the average angler is spending $78. Um, and so the suggested price we're going to is 80 on this one. Again, it's not much more than what the average angler is spending, uh, but it's a little bit more. Um, keeping the one-day fishing license just exactly the same, no change to, to what that's what we have there. But the Boundary Waters fishing license, this is a license that allows a, a uh, non-resident to fish the Boundary Waters, Tahoe, Mead, um, and we're talking about bumping it to $30, it's $29 now. Don't we tell that's who? Yes. Tell that's who? Yeah. Yes. I'm yes. Tell that's who? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Tell that's who? Tell that's also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, coming back to uh, the combination licenses now, um, the resident package. And this is something that, again, all of these were recommending a 365-day season. Uh, suggested price here being $75. If you are like me, um, I, buy, I buy a combo license. A lot of people I, do, I know do. You buy a combo license, you know, you spend $54. And then you buy the Upland Game stamp and a Trout stamp, you're at $74. This is a dollar more than that. The average, uh, Hunter in, in Nevada that, that bought a combo license or angler, and the one who bought the combo license, seventy-two sixty-nine. So again, very close to what you're already spending. Now coming back to the non-resident, uh, this is where we have the opportunity to um, increase a little bit more. And in this case, what we're talking about is going from a hunting license that's one hundred forty-two dollars to a combination license is $155. Currently, the combination license is $199. Um, if we charge the non-resident in an extra $13, and the average non-resident is spending $143 already, um, if they do buy the combo, they're spending $213. This is where we stand to make up um, a little bit of the money that we may be losing on uh, a couple of the other packages we're going to share here at home. Um, what this allows us to do, there's 18,000, over 18,403, that's 2016, that's how many non-residents bought hunting licenses. There were only 408 people that bought combo licenses. If we get, this adds uh, approximately 18,000 more anglers to our Dingle Johnson calculation. When this is all said and done, we get through adding it up. We wind up certifying uh, if this package went through exactly as it is proposed here right now, and then was uh, was adopted, and everybody bought 
license is identical to what they did in 2016, we would wind up with about 25,000 more certified anglers and approximately 80,000 more certified hunters. Um, <clears throat> there is a, currently a one-day non-resident uh, hunting license. We're proposing to go to the, the non-resident package and combination. Um, we are recommending a $2 bump in order to be able to do that at a suggested price then being 23 and keep each consecutive day at $8, which is no change. Another thing we're recommending is that regardless of youth age, if they're between the ages of 12 and 17, <coughs> regardless of whether or not they're a resident or a non-resident, we allow them to buy a youth license and do so at $15. This would get them a combination license. It's not a fishing license. It's not a hunting license. It's a combo license. It's one license for youth no matter where you are doesn't change any of your eligibilities. If you don't have a uh, hunter's ed, it doesn't work for hunting. You have to have hunter's ed. It also doesn't change your eligibility to apply for hunts. So if you're a non-resident youth, you still have to pay a non-resident uh, full price tag if you're going to go on a non-resident hunt. <coughs> And then finally, we're coming back to the, uh, the group of folks, the uh, disabled, the military, the senior, um, even uh, what we're proposing at this point in time is considering Native American, um, throwing them all into one package, and it's, we're calling it a lead package at this point in time, and our suggested price is $15. For most people, um, this winds up being a savings. Most people are buying more stamps and privileges. This includes all the stamps and privileges. Uh, this is one spot uh, where we did have one person from the public mention that this may not be a popular concept for Native Americans. Um, it is a, uh, if we provide people with a free license, we, are, we, have, we have difficulty certifying them as being a hunter or an angler and can, to get that with our Kevin Roberts. And so, um, we would, uh, at this point, I would recommend that we still consider um, some fee at least for any of the Native American licenses that we might offer. The public feedback that we received on this, um, first of all, we, like I said, we did uh, open houses, we did five places, and we weren't overwhelmed with attendance at these meetings either. Um, however, we had some, you know, some pretty significant individuals. We've had uh, a couple of uh, legislators attend. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, some fairly influential people in the uh, in the sportsman community attend. And, uh, and so we had four in Elko, two in Ely, nine in Reno, two in Fallon, and another nine in Vegas. And the only negative comments we received to date. We have one comment from one individual who did not care for the 365. Um, that individual described um, an experience in Arizona that he wanted to be able to hunt deer and, and javelina uh, with the same license. Um, and I think he got confused because if he did it right with a 365 day license, he could hunt deer and javelina in Arizona uh, on the same license. Um, and we also, I mentioned earlier, we have one comment on the acceptability of the Native American licenses. So um, we've been saying all along that these are considerations, but at some point we have to move from considerations to recommendations. Um, currently, um, you know, these price points seem reasonable. Uh, the concept's been really well supported by the, the critical stakeholders that we've spoken to. And uh, again, I come back to you the, the hunters and the anglers being the critical stakeholders in this because they are the most influenced by it. We're still regulating harvest. We're not going to throw the doors open. Um, and if you're not a hunter, there's no change in the expense. So uh, for those reasons, uh, that's kind of where we're at. And uh, be glad to try and entertain any questions. Tell me if you have any thoughts. Regarding the stamps, right now we pick the stamp on the license. Mm -hmm. uh, all the 
this all the physical stuff. Mm -hmm. it, with this, my understanding, it takes away no stamps. So that when you print it on, there wouldn't even, would you still be the deduct stamp like that has the picture on it that they could purchase, or just for collector's purposes? Advice. There is some discussion about that. At this point, I don't know exactly where we want to go with that. Um, a lot of other states have discontinued it. Um, however, there may be sufficient interest that we could continue it and, and send it for the uh, collectors. But our intent is that none of those stamps will be necessary. Okay. <laughs> Brian, on yes. the uh, 365 day license versus the way we're doing it right now, how is that going to change in implementation? Is that going to cause a problem? Or just at one point you stop selling the current style? And uh, Mr. Out. Chairman, that's a really good question. And that's one we've wrestled with in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the points that Warren Chase made in his presentation to the commission is <coughs> go to 365, you've got to make certain that there's no way to gain the system. You know, gaming the system is something I always consider, if I'm using a system, I'm going to use the system to my, my benefit. Um, on the other hand, if I'm building a system, I've got to be careful that I'm not going to subject uh, whatever the purpose of that system is uh, to some form of, uh, of use, and it would be an appropriate use, but in my, I mean, one of the big aspects of this is trying to maintain revenue neutrality. If we create a system whereby and, and Utah advertises. You know, come to Utah, you can buy a license and apply twice. And Arizona similarly went to a 365 day license. Um, however, they did not want to lose that revenue. And so what, what they put in place was a, uh, a stop gap that said, on the last day of the draw, you have to have a license in possession. So if we were to incorporate a regulation such as that, it would make it impossible to game the system. And what Arizona saw was because they had a calendar year license with their draw deadline in February, what they saw was a shift in license purchases from, um, from February, or basically from December to February. My guess, and it, it is purely speculation at this point, is that we're not going to see much difference in when people buy hunting licenses. However, we are going to see probably a bigger shift in how people buy fishing licenses. And so there are likely to be some shift. There's going to be some people that are here in the fall to pursue uh, open game, and they're going to go ahead and buy a, a full uh, combination license because it may make sense to them to do that, and then they can choose to apply. Um, another thing that we've talked about is if you are applying for a hunt and you may be in that your license will expire before the, your hunt begins, um, we could simply, um, in the application process, recognize when the expiration date is and simply tell the, the applicant, if you are drawn for this hunt, you will be issued a hunting license. What time is your life? So, we think there are some ways that we can build some, some protection, some self, uh, self controls into this um, until we should not see a, uh, a dramatic decline in, uh, in our page for that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And this question, Brian, might be as much for Director Wosley and, and you both, but um, and we've had the workshops had all the work that Chase and Chase did, at what point, I would assume you you kind of want a, maybe a commission endorsement on this or some formal feedback from the CAVs, today it's informational, so is the thought at the September meeting to make sure this goes out or some form of this goes out to the CAVs for feedback with potential action item for us to endorse the concepts or the, what we're maybe now calling recommendations? because I know we're kind of entering the BDR development window. Um, are we going to, is the thought to wait until there's an actual bill draft out to solicit that input or? Uh, I would uh, I would say that there probably are enough of the recommendations to where it would be good for us to get it before the commission sooner than later. And Michael, 
hope would be that uh, there's some, some easier answers and that we can continue drafting those easier answers. If, if we get feedback from the commission in September, for example, we can get feedback on those uh, answers and continue to work on the more challenging ones and, and perhaps in November uh, get it all tied up and finalized. So that would be, I guess my thought would be if we're going to do a possible action item on the next agenda is to make sure this and maybe an explanation goes out to all the county advisory boards. I mean, the people that are here today have seen it and kind of can explain it to their boards, but um, for those who aren't or even members of the public who want to look through this, I think having this as support material ahead of the meeting is going to be key. Yes. What about an extension on a license that they already have perhaps maybe they need to get the um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, interesting ideas like that one that have come up in the course of discussion about this. And um, just speaking for myself at this point in time without having had a chance to discuss it about it with the rest of the team, my initial response is that we have been trying to keep this as simple as possible without trying to get it too cloudy with any of the, um, you know, uh, different versions that we might have. We want this to be as simple as we possibly can so that we can get as much support for it and hopefully move it through the legislature this year. I'm not saying that's a bad idea. Um, I think that's the type of, of consideration we may want to come back to at a later date. Um, currently, um, they don't even have the 365 that they can use um, to their advantage. So um, I think this would help them along the way to extend that license. Um, and that, that's what my first question is about the response on that. Brian, I know you didn't do it as part of this study, but in the information you got from the other states, how many of those other states offer like that? Lifetime licenses are something that there's, I can't tell you exactly how many different states offer them currently. There are some that do, Idaho has, Arizona does. Um, just about everybody that I've spoken to from those states in their fiscal world, um, it becomes challenging to manage. Um, and primarily because each of those, each of those lifetime licenses, as you're certifying them to be part of the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services grant process, um, essentially they have to come up with an amortization schedule. If I sell you a lifetime license today, I don't know how long you're going to live. And so we have to have some way of accounting for that. Um, obviously some states have, have been capable of doing it, um, but our sense is that um, it, it's probably more difficult uh, than, than valuable. Um, the, uh, one of the questions that Chase and Chase asked as a commitment uh, through this effort was um, what's the value of, say, a three-year license or something like that. Um, there was support for it. Um, you know, we asked, you know, what if we reduced the fee by 5%? What if we reduced the fee by 10%? And the approach they use in asking those questions is they'll only ask a third of the respondents, each one of them, so not asking the same uh, respondent, how do you feel about this, how do you feel about 5%, how do you feel about 10%. So it's more of an independent way of getting a sense on that. And there really wasn't, in fact, in one case, there was people responding with more reluctance to buy a 10% fishing license, 10% of fishing license, than the people who were offered a three-year license at no reduction. So it's kind of a curious thing. Um, what uh, Chase and Chase recommended is rather than trying to complicate our uh, accounting, is just simply send out an automatic reminder. A lot of other states do that. You know, your your license is about to expire. Would you like to to obtain it? Um, any further questions, Brian? What, what was this, Brian? The, the overall, the average input amount of money. Percentage-wise, we collect under the new system as compared to the old. Was how much? It was fourteen thousand, and uh, I want to say about eight hundred dollars. So it's an 
the negative amount really when you compare it to the total. Exactly. It's less than two tenths of one percent. Our intent, and that's the thing, we could have gone through this exercise without ever having to talk to the public. Um, yeah. But we've spent a year talking to the public now about this this process and probably been a little less than a year since the first time we, we started sharing it publicly. But we We've been to the public no fewer than three different times. We've had this is the third commission meeting that's been out. Um, we'll have it at a fourth one, and at least a fourth one. And so we've we spent an awful lot of time trying to share this with the with the public. And we just within the last month and a half did the math to figure out what the numbers were. And we wanted to make sure everybody supported it, and then we tried to keep it as close to the neutral as possible. Doesn't mean that in two years we may not be coming back and saying, you know what, based on what we're seeing, we now need to, to adjust fees. But we haven't touched our fees since 2004, and we're not recommending any changes to license to, to the tags or the application fees. Yes. Mike, question on the Certainly, we would love to see more people that get engaged in hunting and fishing. Um, but um, just that aside, right now we have, uh, when you look at the licenses that we have listed in the first, first draft, are 28 different licenses, and we've reduced that to seven. And so we're hoping it's going to simplify people's lives so that they're not making inadvertent errors. We're eliminating the ability to make intentional errors in some cases. And um, hopefully it'll make it simpler. Yes. People will be more willing to try something new. Yes. Any further questions? And then we'll move on to uh, the last section of item 19. Nevada Department of Wildlife update of guidelines for harvest management, Nevada Game Division. The department will provide an update on the status and process of refining the draft harvest guidelines for potential future adoption by the Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the commission. Um, I want to hand out a couple of uh, draft documents. Um, one um, is one that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, for members of the public, I've got copies of these out on the, uh, on the back table out there, so uh, feel free to take those. Um, but I wanted to give the commission a copy, and there's two drafts of this. Um, one is called the Current Practices Review Draft 3. Um, this is the one that we've been working really hard to identify what it is we do now. And then the second one is the initial revised draft. So I'll provide a copy of each. Simpler, uh, make things easier. 
Um, this is something that's been worked on by an internal team. Um, and these are the folks in Meyer, Caleb Matthew. If you don't know Caleb, um, you can shut the lights off right now and you can watch his sheet flow. Um, he's uh, in the audience. Um, Cody McKee, Cody Schroeder, Mark Fries, Mike Cox, Mike Scott, Wilson Luthenholm, Sean Espinosa, Steve Kimmel, and Tom Donner. Uh, Pat Jackson, for some reason I left you off of that list. Pat Jackson's also in the room. He's also played an important role in this. Um, this has been something that we've all been uh, working on. Um, and it's it's a, uh, a challenging thing. Our intent with, with this from the get-go has been to, uh, to, to capture all of the things that we do currently as we and what we manage towards with our various uh, hunting hunting seasons. And we spent a fair bit of time talking about a lot of different things that go along with um, a, a harvest recommendation. The department um, provides a recommendation and the commission is ultimately tasked with making a decision and using the input that they receive from the public and the cab to determine that. And oftentimes we we hear people say, well, <clears throat> the science should drive it, science should make decisions. Um, we have what we call biological sideboards on any of the recommendations we make. Um, an example that I've used before the commission before is that typically you can manage buck to doe ratios on mule deer hunts anywhere between 10 and 40 bucks per 100 does and have no influence on the reproductive capability of that herd. They will have just as many bonds with 10 as they do with 40, and they'll recruit them into the population at the same rate. If you drop below 10, there typically is not uh, the, the ability for those bucks to, to breed all the does becomes challenging. On the other hand, if you get above 40, you tend to have diminished recruitment, oftentimes probably as a direct result of competition on the winter range or something of that nature. It's less clear, but, but we do see those relationships. <clears throat> and so between 10 and 40, that's the commission's project. That, that's, that's where the commission um, provides the department with direction. And what our objective has been is to develop these, these recommendations, these recommended guidelines, and share that with the commission. Now, these are not the, the, uh, the draft that you see that's uh, the um, current practices of draft three. Um, that is what we've been able to determine based on reviewing all of the documents that are available to us, uh, the predator plan, the, the mule deer plan, the elk plans, uh, guidelines that may come to us from WAPA, that, that captures what we currently do. And as we went through that, we noted that there were some, some places um, where things were missing. And some places where we didn't exactly do what we said we were going to do. But what our goal was to try and capture the, the current practices as much as what possible, what we currently do. <clears throat> now, we're ultimately looking for the commission to provide us um, an affirmation and approval of the guidelines that we're going to um, come forward. And I've got a, a timeline I'm going to try and share with you here in a little bit. But when we do that, these are not commission regulation, they're not commission general regulation, they're not rules, they don't go through the process that Tony outlined earlier, but essentially this is a affirmation of what the commission wants us to move forward with. And then that way when we come to you with recommendations and seasons or seasons and quotas, they will be in alignment with this. The commission at any time can choose to deviate from these guidelines. Uh, because they're not binding. And so if there's some rationale that CAP may bring forward, uh, public may bring forward, and then the commission agrees, <clears throat> there's certainly the ability to go outside of these guidelines. Um, on the other hand, it also is not binding to the, to the department. However, if we bring you forward a recommendation, um, we're going to tell you that it's outside guidelines and we're going to tell you why. Um, and so from a communication standpoint, my direction standpoint, that, that's my main objective is to get the commission to tell us what it, is, what it is you want us to manage for. We're certainly suggesting what we think is prudent and, 
anything since I started this exercise and the first time I brought it before the community was a year ago. And at that time I said, I'm not trying to try and change what we do. And it was pointed out to me uh, recently um, at one of our internal meetings that, you know, Brian, it sure sounds an awful lot like you're trying to change what we do. And let me give you a little bit of an example of what I mean when I say I'm not trying to change what we do. Our mule deer plan states that we should manage for 30 bucks per hundred dose. I am not advocating that we change that. I think that, that that's been established through public process and what, what the commission has wrestled with over the years. Um, there are some things that we've